from Nashville's First Church of the Nazarene. You are invited to join us in worship with The Real Life. Located downtown at 510 Woodland Street on the east bank of the Cumberland River. The life of Christ received, shared together, and extended to others with passion. For the next half hour, let us share the life of Christ together through the clear Bible teaching of Pastor Kevin M. Olmet. Let's go into the worship now. I have what you need, but you keep on searching. I've done all the work, but you keep on working. When you're running on empty and you can't find a remedy, just come to the well. You can spend your whole life.
we have something within us as human beings, all of us do, which resists even when we know what we will fight for is better, risking anything to get there. You remember that wonderful conversation that took place in Numbers chapter 14 <laughs> when Moses was saying, it's time to go. It's time to rise up. It's time to resist. And some of the folks responded and said, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Remember that? Our wives and our little children will be carried off as plunder. And they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and let's go back into slavery. Slavery was better than the risk of freedom. Slavery looks awfully good right now compared to the risk of moving forward and moving on from where we've been. At least we had plenty to eat. At least the relative necessities of life were provided for us. Oh, we were slaves, no question. We lived in tyranny. But at least we were comfortable to an extent. The temptation to retreat, to embrace the status quo, to stay in our comfort zones and preserve what we have is always attractive to the people of God. I want you to hear that again. The temptation to retreat, to embrace the status quo, to stay in our comfort zones and preserve what we have is always attractive to the people of God. This has been a battle. You think it's a battle now in the 21st century or the late 20th century that's unique somehow in Christian history? Please understand, this has been a battle since Christ was on earth and frankly before him through the entire history of the chosen people of God in the Old Testament. This is a problem that is perennial and it's constant. Stay where you are. Knowing it's not where God wants you to be, knowing something much better is out there ahead, knowing that with the risk and price of change, things are better in the kingdom. But oh, it's comfortable to stay right here. The desire that drove William Wallace to give his all for the cause of freedom must similarly drive us to give our all for the advancement of God's kingdom. Infusing all we are and everything we do with passionate energy to share the life of Christ with others. As the old song says, this is how it feels to be free. When you know your sins are forgiven and you know you are in the center of God's will and you know those with whom you serve in service to the kingdom are seeking the center of the will of God, moving forward, charging ahead, not retreating, not staying in comfort zones, because the kingdom is too important. Turn to our main text this morning then of Galatians chapter 1, just for a few moments. Galatians chapter 1. Paul is now writing to the church at Galatia, our main text for these 10 weeks, the book of Galatians. And he's reflecting on those events that you just read about from the historical account in the book of Acts. And he's wanting to remind people that he's writing to because he is still dealing with remnants of the way that he used to defend and the truth that he used to believe in 
now trying to contaminate the kingdom of Christ and mess things up for the early church and misdirect people into believing that they had to stay in spiritual slavery while at the same time they were professing to be free in Christ Jesus. And he was trying to point out, you can't have it both ways. You're either free or you're not. You either take the risk and embrace Christ without the restraints of the traditions that we all were in at one time. Or you stay in bondage. That's his argument all through the book of Galatians. And he preaches and professes over and over again, we have been called to freedom. We've not been called to go back to that. It's a risk, but you've got to take it, he says. And in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, he gets very personal. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that I preached is not of human source. I did not receive this from another human being. I was not taught this at the foot of some great teacher like I was taught the things that I was teaching to you before. No, this gospel that I am now preaching, I received, you got to hear this, by revelation from Jesus Christ. God himself in Christ came and confronted me. I think he probably, if he was reading this at some point, instead of just writing it, he probably would have paused and he would have said, remember the story. When God himself confronted me in the embodiment of the risen Christ and called me by name. Remember, I've told you that story a hundred times, but I'm going to tell it again. He called me by name and I said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> and he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This gospel was received by unmediated revelation. This gospel was received directly without a middleman. I heard from God himself. For I know you know of my previous way of life in Judaism. How intensely I persecuted the church of Christ. And I tried to destroy it. And he says something in the 14th verse that he'll say in other ways and other epistles, but he's trying to point out he was not your average Jew. He says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age. He says in another place in Philippians, if you could be perfect by the law, by the system that I had given my life for, guess what? I achieved it. I was perfect. He says that in another letter. I'm not your average dude who just casually says, I believe. No, I was the embodiment of everything we taught. And I perfected it and I completed it holistically. I was the man, is what he was saying. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. <laughs> I want you to hear that. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, Saul already recognizes now, I have now found the reason for which I was made. I have now discovered the purpose for which I was put on this earth. All those years I thought I was serving God, I now understand I wasn't. All that time that I thought I was right, I now understand I'm wrong. All of the reasons for which I am on this earth have now been made abundantly clear to me. I understand that God set me apart from the day I was born and called me. And now I understand it was by his grace, not by his law, that I was called. And I was and was pleased to reveal his son, Jesus Christ, in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. This did not come from man. This came from God. That's exciting stuff. And drop down to verse 23. They only heard the report 
the churches of Judea that are in Christ, they heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Saul had been living his life preserving the highest traditions of Judaism, complete with the exclusive circle the wagons mindset of protecting the system. His conversion set him free from this whole understanding, and he begins proclaiming to all who would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now hear this. Paul moves from this temptation the people of God always struggle with, from preserving to extending. From preserving to sharing, from keeping to giving, from hoarding and defending to offensively throwing it out there. And the world's history, nor the kingdom of God, has ever been the same since. You realize that? The world's history has literally been changed in remarkable ways because a man named Saul responded to the voice and vision of God, embraced the faith, changed the course of his life, and became the spokesperson for the kingdom. The world changed, and the kingdom of God's never been the same. It's the challenge to every part of our lives this morning, our time I want to be very clear about something I've said on occasion across these couple of years, but I want you to hear it again this morning. If you ever hear or perceive a message that we want you to overextend, you've heard wrong. No one should overextend themselves. We all have a limit what we can do. When we present ministries to you, whether on this platform or in some other setting, we know that most of you cannot do all of this. In fact, none of you can do all of this. And we're not trying to put a guilt trip on you. We're trying to open up possibilities and open doors for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You should not walk through them unless the Spirit of God reveals to you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to hear that today. But our time has got to be surrendered to the kingdom of God. Not for overextension. God does not burn us out. God made us with the built-in necessity of some rest and relaxation after all. He himself rested, don't forget. We're in his image. But your time is surrendered to God. Not to be overextended, but to be fulfilled in serving him and his kingdom in whatever it is you do. As we preached about a few weeks ago in the other series, everything we do should be done to what? The glory of God. Everything we do. Our career, our job, our family, our relationships, our leisure, everything is to the glory of God. Our time has got to be surrendered. And God is speaking to some of you about involvement in ministry, and you're fearful and you're scared. We're not calling you to overextend. We're offering you opportunities to walk through doors and become part of the process of not accepting the status quo, but becoming part of the solution for the kingdom of God, of change, and of extending the life of Christ to people who desperately need it. Our talents have got to be surrendered to the kingdom of God. Our talents. That doesn't mean that only those, and thank God for these that do, and and, and may their number greatly increase. Amen, Dr. Deal? But that doesn't mean that only those who sit on this platform giving musical talent to God, that that's the only way you do this. Please don't misunderstand that. If you have a talent, and all of you have some kind of talent, it is simply surrender to God. Now, God, how do you want me to use this for the kingdom? For some of you, that means on a platform, leading people in worship. For other of you, it is taking the talents God has given you and communicating that or extending that through other means or mechanisms in the church, in the community, But all for who? The glory of God. So those who have artistic capacity, 
become possibly involved in a new arts academy that's going to reach out to a neighborhood and a community and say, hey, we want to help you understand that your creative capacity comes not from yourself, but from God. And it's for his glory. See? And then our treasure. All that I have becomes God's. It really always has been his. This is the great wake-up call that many of us have to come to. <laughs> we always thought it was ours, and we have this great spiritual moment of surrender. Oh, God, I now understand this little 10%. And for most of us, it's 3 or 4 or 5 or 2 or 1%. But that's another day. That's another Sunday in the series. <laughs> Aren't you looking forward to that one? But we have this little idea that somehow we're making this great Surrender. Well, God, you know, it's, you, you've asked for 10%. So, so you know, I, I am, I could do a lot of things with this, God, but I am giving it up for you. Don't you appreciate me now? <laughs> That's how we think. The scripture says it's all God's. We've gotten this so out of whack. Everything we have is God's. Everything we earn is God's. How did you earn it? Because he enabled you too. How did you have a place to earn it from? Because he opened a door for you to walk through to be able to do that. Whose is it after all? It's his. We found out a few years ago, a lot of things we thought was ours wasn't ours, right? It was called the Great Recession. And things we had been told will never, ever pass away. And you know what? They passed away. Did you have any of that happen in your life? Were you checking your retirement funds during those years? Were you checking the value of your house during those times? Did you really think that was yours and you controlled that? No. That's God's. And all of that is subject to whatever he wants to do with it and is also subject to a lot of forces that he has nothing to do with that will affect you because you live in this world. But it's all his. And we are not to live in slavery or in tyranny in any of these issues. They're to all be surrendered to God. That's why we offer Financial Peace University. And it starts Wednesday night. And all the instructions for signing up for that are in your bulletin this morning. If you and your family are in bondage to financial issues and you can't seem to make ends meet, you have the opportunity to have the vice president of the Dave Ramsey operation, Jack Galloway Jr., who's a member of this church, to teach you the principles of getting that right. And understanding it all comes from God, and it all goes back to God, and it's all for his glory, everything we have. Don't miss this opportunity if you need it. We don't want people living in financial bondage. Because, you know, you can't be generous if you're in bondage. You realize that? You can hear about generosity, but it's always this roiling tension and strife within you because you can't be generous. Please understand, generosity is not reserved for lottery winners, a huge percentage of which go bankrupt in five to ten years after they win, after saying it was all going to be given away, and it seldom if ever is. They're in more bondage after they win most of the time than they were before. Financial freedom comes to people who understand the principles that God has established in his word about where it comes from, whose it is, who owns it, and who can give us direction what to do with it. Wow, that's freedom. It does cost something to embrace this freedom. It's called the risk of faith. Some people don't like that word risk. They say, well, if we know it's true, how can you say that's a risk? Because you're staking your life on it. You're walking away from the things you can touch, feel, and see, and staking not only the rest of your life on this earth, but eternity on something that happened 2,000 years ago, namely that Jesus Christ came to earth as God in the flesh, died, and was resurrected and will come again from the right hand of the Father where he sits today. And you stake your life on it. 
I don't want to quibble about words, but that's a risk of faith to me. And it will cost you everything. Because once you understand what he's done for you and that he calls you to do the same thing for him that he's done for you, you understand taking up your cross means I assume the cruciform position. And I say, God, you can have all that I am, all that I've got, all that that I'm not, everything I ever hope to be, it's all yours. I'm yours. And it may cost you as it has cost some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in places like Kenya and Syria in the last few weeks, and we never know all the places those things are happening, it may cost you your life. It may cost you friends. It may cost you social status. It may cost you acceptability in some circles, but you are not living for those surface earthly things now. You're living for an eternal kingdom that does not pass away. It cost William Wallace his life when he said, we're going to fight for freedom. And they decided to join him in the fight. But here's the question this morning. What are you preserving that needs releasing? What are you protecting that needs to be given away? What are you willing to give up to be part of something beyond yourself that has eternal significance? In the next eight weeks, as we ask some very penetrating questions about specific areas of our lives that we are often enslaved to and don't want to admit it, I want to remind you, for everything you are freed from, there's something better you are freed to. In fact, listen to the testimony of true freedom from the Apostle Paul himself in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless. Did you hear that? Everything else is worthless. Would you say that phrase with me again? Everything else is worthless. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, that I may gain Christ. Those are his words, not mine. From somebody who counted the cost and paid it, gave it up for something so much better. This is Pastor Kevin M. Ullman thanking you for joining us today for The Real Life. For more information, visit our website at www.nfcn.org and worship live with us at 510 Woodland Street at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. May God bless you.